Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Moose Henderson. I'm a wildlife photographer and today we're going to be talking about composition. This will be part three in our series. We previously did part one and part two. In part one we covered six of the rules or guidelines of composition such as the rule of thirds, the left to right rule, the isolate your subject guideline, the leave negative space, the rule of space where we leave space in front of an animal for the animal to move, and foreground interest and depth. So those were the first six guidelines we covered in the first video and I'll link that up here if you haven't seen it yet. We cover them in a lot more depth. And in the second video, we covered centered and symmetry, patterns and textures, filling the frame, simplicity and minimalism, color combinations, and movement or implied movement. So these were the first 12 items that we covered on composition in our first two videos. We have six more guidelines or rules of composition to cover today. And we'll get to that right after this. Now we're back. Our first rule or guideline for today in this part three is called frame within a frame. Now we've all seen landscape images where someone has taken a picture through a window, say an old wooden cabin or something like that, and you've got the frame of the window showing in the picture with the wood grain and stuff like that. And then through the window, you can see like a mountain range or something like that. And that's called frame within a frame. So how do you incorporate that into wildlife photography? Well, one way you can do it is to have an out of focus foreground. For instance, if you have a tree that has limbs that is framing an animal like this picture of this deer and we have this tree limb going around the deer or you can even have totally out of focus things like this moose that has the foreground of snowy items completely out of focus. So by using these out of focus items in your photograph, you draw interest directly in to your subject. You're framing of these items helps to draw the interest directly into your subject. So this is our first item for today. Our second item is leading lines. This is like a path or a road that leads up to something. We've all seen this in landscape photography where they use a fence line of a wooden fence or maybe a rocky border or a curved road like I've used here in this photograph where we have the curved road going into the arch of Yellowstone. And I've used these lights of the cars to also emphasize the curved road. We can also use this 
in wildlife photography, if you have an animal that's standing on a trail or something like that, photograph low down and show the trail going up to the animal. And this leads the eye into the photograph and directly to the animal. The next rule that we have is called the rule of odds. Now, for some reason, humans tend to like odd numbers better than they do even numbers. So if you're going to show multiple animals in your frame, sometimes it's better to show three instead of two. Now, of course, it's easy to show one, and of course, one is the prime odd number that we all know about. But to complicate your images, include multiple animals. And then that really gets challenging, trying to get all three animals or all five animals looking in the same direction. It's hard enough to get one animal looking in the same direction. So if you really want to turn up the heat, try and put three animals in your picture or five animals in your picture and get them all doing the same thing at once. So that is the rule of odds, having an odd number seems more pleasing than having an even number. Now, I'm not saying that having an even number is bad. Having an even number can be good also, like you see in this picture of the two foxes looking at each other. This makes a very nice, pleasing image. The fourth rule or guideline of composition for this video is point of view. Now, we all know that it's best to get eye level with your animals. People are used to seeing everything as humans from eye level. So when we look at a squirrel or something like that, we're looking down at the squirrel. So when you take your picture of a squirrel from eye level, this is captivating for the viewer because they're not used to seeing the animal from eye level. Of course, it's a little more challenging to get down, especially when you get older, because our bones get a little creaky and stuff like that. But usually the animals are going to stay roughly in the same area. So if you get down to their eye level, you're going to make a much more captivating image. Here's a couple of images that I shot from eye level. For instance, here's a chipmunk that's on a log, and then here is a badger that's shot at eye level. Of course, it's a little bit more dangerous to shoot a badger at eye level than it is a chipmunk. I kind of think of a badger as an animal that needs an anger management program. They always seem to be pissed off. But it makes a pretty good image when you get down eye level with them. Number five for our, our compositional rules today is balance the elements of your scene. If you're going to have two animals, have it so that they're balanced in the scene and your image doesn't feel lopsided. If you're going to include trees along with your animals, then balance them in your scene so that it feels like everything is in harmony. It's important that we feel like the, the scene is balanced. Even if you include like mountains in the background and an animal in the foreground, try to balance it out so that one element balances out the other element in the scene. Our last element for today is juxtaposition. Now, juxtaposition can be two things that are similar or two things that are opposite in the same scene. So say you have a moose and an elk in the same scene. Now, that's juxtaposition. It kind of throws your eye off and you kind of rotate between the two because of that that juxtaposition, that unbalancedness, and it, it gives a little tension to the scene. 
You can also have something like an animal and a flower in the same scene. And those are two different items. And so your eye kind of bounces back and forth between these two animals, between these two items, and it gives the scene a little bit of tension, thereby making it a little more interesting. You could have a bear going after a salmon, and that would be a good juxtaposition. You could have something as simple as an animal eating, and you've got the juxtaposition of the animal and the plant that he's eating, or maybe his tongue is hanging out as he's trying to eat off the plant. So that gives you a good idea of a couple of rules and guidelines for composition. And this covers all 18 of my rules or guidelines for composition. So how do we put these into practice? Obviously, if the animal is way off in the distance, we can't do just a face shot, but it's good to practice each of these as you have an opportunity. Say you have an animal that's fairly close to you and you're shooting out the car door, and so you're relatively safe and you're using your one to 400 millimeter lens and at 400 millimeters, you can get nothing but a face shot. Well, in those circumstances, you can practice the centered and symmetry rule or guideline. You can practice the isolate your subject guideline and stuff. So it's important to keep each of these guidelines in mind. And then when you see something, when you see a road leading up to an animal, then you can use the road as a leading line. When the animal is off in the distance and you have a sunrise or a sunset and it's really beautiful, you can use the difference in color combinations to draw the eye to the animal and to make the scene look a little bit more pleasing. You have the rule of thirds, which we've all kind of had beaten under our head but that's one thing that you can always keep in mind. Put your animal off center in the scene in one of those four PowerPoints where the rule of thirds cross. If you can't get him in a PowerPoint, maybe put the eye on one of the third lines and that helps to increase the balance of the photograph and increase the intensity of the photograph and not have everything just centered in the middle of the photograph. Now it seems easy to talk about this stuff, but then when you get out in the field, you're looking through your viewfinder and you have a focus point that maybe is in the center. And so when you take your picture, the animal's in the center. Well, no, what you do is move that focus point over to where you want to photograph the animal. And if the animal is moving, think to yourself, where is the animal moving? How do I want to compose this scene? And then move your focus point to that place and let the animal move to that place. And then you take your picture. Now, it takes a bit of practice to be able to do all of this. But as we say, practice makes perfect. You get out there day after day after day after day, and you shoot ordinary animals that you see every day. Say that you live in Florida, and you have gray squirrels. Well, you know, gray squirrels aren't quite as dynamic as uh, a flying crane or something like that. But they are available, and they're easy to practice with. So you go out there each day and you practice with this squirrel that's in your backyard, maybe feeding at the bird feeder. And you start practicing putting the animal in the rule of thirds, or you start practicing getting a face shot, nothing but a face shot with its centered and symmetry. Or you practice leading lines leading up to the animal, or you practice the rule of odds, getting three squirrels at once in your image. And 
once you start practicing these rules of composition or these compositional guidelines, they become second nature. And then as you go out to shoot, say you go to the Tetons or you go to Yellowstone or something like that, because you've been practicing these rules of composition, they become second nature. You see a bear coming towards you and you immediately know how you want to frame this image. Do you want to frame it in the middle? Do you want to frame it on the thirds? Do you want a leading line going up to this animal? Do you want foreground interest and depth? All of these things start popping into your mind and rolling around. But because you practice them at home with your neighborhood squirrels, they're now second nature and your mind works very quickly. And then you go, oh, I want to do foreground interest and depth. So I'm going to set an aperture of F11. Or I want to do an animal scape and have the animal in the foreground and the landscape in the background like the mountains. So I want to do F16 on this particular image and put the animal in one of the third PowerPoints and then have the mountains in the background. Or I want to do a centered and symmetry one. So I shut down to maybe F5.6 or F7.1 so that only the animal face is sharply in focus. And the more you practice these things, the more that they become second nature and the better that you are at getting these things in your frame and nailing your exposures and nailing your compositions and coming home with really good images to be able to hang on your wall. So I hope these 18 rules of composition, six that we did today, six that we did during the first video on composition and six more we did on the second video on composition, will help you to improve your images and help you to be able to get those prize winning images, those banger images that you want to hang on your wall show to others and enter into competitions. If this has been good for you, please hit the like icon. Consider subscribing to our channel so you can see a lot more content in the coming days and weeks. We upload a video at least once a week, sometimes multiple times a week, and we really appreciate you following and being a part of our journey. So I thank you very much, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.